Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar series, Living with Lions. I'm Jessica Jansen, and I'm the Development Coordinator for the Mountain Lion Foundation. Today, we have a very special guest. We have photographer Roy Toft. Roy started working as a full-time wildlife photographer in 1991, spending six to nine months in the field every year, producing natural history content for magazines, books, and more. Around 2000, Roy started leading photography safaris around the world to photography enthusiasts, as well as continuing his assignment and his stock work. In 2005, Roy became the founding member of the International League of Con Conservation Photographers. This is an elite group of professionals who give their talents to the world of conservation every single time they go out in the field. Roy's images have been published widely in National Geographic, Audubon Society, Smithsonian, and more. His really incredible coffee table book, Osa, Where the Rainforest Meets the Sea, is a wonderful tribute to the incredible biodiversity of Costa Rica. So I wanna invite Roy to join us now, and I'm super excited that he is here. Welcome, Roy, we're so excited to have you. I'm just excited to get my video to work and <laughs> Can you hear me. It happens. That is that is the way technology goes in, in this in this realm. Um, while we're working on that, I think it would be really great uh, to share a video that Roy shared with us that I think is just phenomenal. So we're going to have Chelsea um, bring that up for us and share that with everyone. I can't hear the sound on my side, but the sound in this video is pretty good too. Just the licking of the water and there's purring, the baby's purring the whole time. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That is what people who love wildlife really live for. Yeah, we did have an issue with the sound. I'm, I'm sorry to our guests. There's nothing we love more than the purr of a mountain lion. And unfortunately, technology just uh, sometimes thwarts us in what we're trying to do. But it, it really is a, a lovely, lovely image. And uh, thank you, Roy, for sharing that with us. Um, that really is something very, very special. Um, so welcome. I would love to dive in with some questions if you are, are amenable to that. Yeah, ready to go. Absolutely. So I would love to start out by asking you what probably a lot of people are thinking. Where did the love of photography come from? And, and has the camera been a part of your life since you were very young? And how did your subject matter become wildlife? And, and how did that develop into being the puma? Um, actually, before photography, it was all about animals. So um, all of my work in photography and getting into um, photography is based from loving animals and wanting to be around animals. So when I grew up, uh, pretty much from the age of eight, I, I grew up here in San Diego and pretty much spent every day. I was the snake guy on the block. So I had the whole garage full of snakes and uh, I appreciated other wildlife too, but I was really into herps. And uh, later when I went to college uh, and got a degree in wildlife biology, of course, my appreciation grew for a lot broader span of wildlife. And I received my first nice camera when I graduated from college. So I didn't start young. And uh, the day after I graduated, I was doing a project in Alaska for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we were studying wolves. So we were collaring wolves. And I had my brand new camera in Alaska a day after graduating. So it was pretty, pretty much of a nice launch to be a, a wildlife biologist and be in Alaska and have my brand new camera. Um, so that, that kind of was the start of it. So I have to ask you, this camera probably is very important to you. Do you still have this camera? I do not have this camera anymore. Unfortunately, it was a Canon AE-1, if people know cameras. Uh, this is, of course, back in the film days. Um, and yeah, that was a great camera. And uh, unfortunately, it's not in my closet. Do you as a photographer, I know that we're really moving into a digital realm, but did you develop your own photographs back when that was more popular? 
You know, really no, because uh, all of us that were working with nature, we're all shooting slides. So we're shooting positive film, which you really just can't develop that process in your, in your, you know, your own dark room, like you can a negative. So we all work from slides. So I didn't have to play with the chemicals and be in the dark room. Gotcha. And, and this kind of leads into my, my next question with all the advancements in technology and, and new ways of approaching art. Um, what kind of gear do you recommend um, for someone who might be wanting to follow in your footsteps? Well, you know, the, the, the level of gear now is, you know, a hundred times better than what we were shooting with in the early days. Just, um, you, you can't go wrong, really. If you pick up any D DSLR, um, the entry level cameras now are so good that even, you know, if you're shooting Canon, you know, the entry level Rebels or Nikons, uh, Sony, the mirrorless is kind of the new realm. So a lot of us are jumping to mirrorless because of the high ISO capabilities. So being able to shoot in low light is enhanced with uh, mirrorless. Uh, they're a little smaller and lighter. Um, and uh, yeah, we're always, you know, we're always hoping for a silver bullet for as photographers like, oh, if I buy this new thing, it's gonna make me a better photographer. Um, that usually doesn't work out, you know, um, the, the building blocks for being a good photographer are patience, hard work, you know, determination and learning your craft. And so just buying things is not going to make you a great photographer. But I have to say the technology, it's, it's never been easier than it is now to take a photo. Uh, you have instant feedback. You know, you have a TV on the back of your camera that tells you if you're screwing up. Uh, we didn't have that. You know, back in the day, I had to come home, send my uh, rolls of film off to Kodak, get processed. Two, three weeks later, I'd get back, look on my light table, my slides, and go, oh, crap. I screwed that up. I'm not on location anymore. I can't just, you know, shoot it again. So um, it's a different animal now, but it's never been more fun. I mean, I enjoy photography today more than I have, ever, you know, really ever. Yeah, that's amazing. And I have to agree with you. The first time I ever went to Africa, I bought a Canon Rebel, especially for that trip. And, and I took a bunch of photos, but then I, I let a friend of mine who didn't have a camera at the time borrow my camera and everything he shot was far better than when I shot on the Canon Rebel. So it really wasn't about that particular camera. It was that he had a gift that I just did not, did not share. Yeah. It's a skill, you know, like any skill, you have to develop it. You have to learn the technical side of it, you know, the shutter speeds, the apertures, all that stuff. But then you have to really have that that need or that want to to be creative. And, you know, over the top imagery is really about exciting the mind and the eye. And we need to see things different. We can't just look at the same perspective all the time. So that's kind of why we're going to be talking about camera traps here, I'm sure. But that's kind of why, you know, the camera trap phenomena is has really caught on not only because we can capture animals and situations that we've never been able to capture but it's wide angle close up with a predator and we just don't ever see predators like that so it's it's exciting to see these wide angle shots of pumas and you know whatever wildlife yeah and and as we're watching your images come across the screen right these are breathtaking images and I think it would help give us some perspective. You get incredible shots like this one that you see on the screen here. How many shots do you have that just don't work out at all before you get a shot like this one? Um, well, what we're looking at is a lot of pumas in Patagonia in Chile. So these are, you know, just out photographing pumas. It's not a remote camera or anything. And for, you know, these situations, it's all about the evolution of a situation. You know, to have mom with all four cubs there, you don't roll into this sighting, right? It's, you know, pre-dawn tracking, looking on ridgetops, finding where mom is, then slowly approaching, see, thinking about where she's going to go. So then starting to shoot 100 yards away, you know, then 75 yards away. Then she's approaching closer. Backgrounds are changing. Light's getting better. So um, most images that you ever get to see from me oh it's it's hours into the shoot because they all things are always getting better right the animals getting more relaxed with you being there i'm having more ideas 
about what to do with the scene. Um, so really, yeah, you never get your 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 A plus images when you roll into a scene. It's all develops, and you know, hour three, hour four. Now you're getting the good stuff. You know. Yeah, and and that's a great segue into my next question. It seems as if tracking wildlife and then waiting for the right moment is a huge part of what you do. How far have you tracked uh, an animal to get a shot, and how long have you waited for one shot? What's the longest in in both situations? You know, um, for of course for pumas, you know, or snow leopards, you know, um, we could we track all day and not find anything. Um, so um, generally, then we go home, you know, and then we got to start over again. Um, as far as waiting for situations, I think the best example is is sitting in blinds. I mean, we, you know, this I have a passion project for harpy eagles. So I've been the last three years I've been going down to Brazil and climbing up trees 100 feet tall and sitting in a blind across from a harpy eagle nest you know six nests now uh, over the three years um so that's 13 hours a day sitting in that blind you know pre-dawn get up in the tree once the sun goes down rappel down the tree and you know overnight and then back in the tree the next morning so you know 13 14 days are usually my my kind of my time frames when i go and do that so um and some people aren't made for blind work you know it's it's can be extremely boring for some people um they want to be chasing things they want to be in a vehicle in africa okay i got that move on to the next thing for me being in the blind is never boring it is the most uh magical place to be sitting in the hopes of something happening where you're a fly on the wall right no one knows you're there none of the animals know you're there that is just so compelling to me. Um, and as a, as a nature photographer, that there's nothing better than to sit in a blind for me and know I'm looking at baby harpies and no dad's gonna be bringing in a sloth any, any second. And it might be three days, but any second that could happen. And so that's, that's yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, and it's funny when you talk about being in a blind, which a lot of people will never experience uh, when when i when i spent time in africa for people to really get a concept of this when you we would do waterhole counts and when we would go to a blind you go out at about three or four in the morning when it's still dark and you can't play music you can't speak above a whisper um you go with your bagged lunch and you just you wait it's just this like long period of waiting so the fact that you did this and you spent six to nine months in the field and a lot of it is in this type of situation where you have to be almost like an animal yourself kind of waiting to pounce much like the mountain lion so the amount of patience that you must have waiting for these shots waiting for these moments like we see here this beautiful moment um really is incredibly impressive to me as a human being because we live in a culture of wanting to do things immediately and this really is like you said a, the long game of of waiting all this out um so that's really really incredible um tell me a little bit about the international league of conservation photographers tell me how that came to be and and really what your your purpose is because it, it's quite impressive oh thanks so yeah in 2005 um at a world wilderness congress in alaska um a lady by the name of christina minnemeyer came had this idea of connecting um top professionals in photography uh, with the common goal of working towards conservation and to have kind of a vetted group that are already paid their dues. Um, it's not a group you can pay pay to get into. You can't just sign up. You have to be asked to join, or you know, it's it's kind of this this hence the league. And uh, the idea is to have this uh, this kind of group effort to push conservation issues through our photography, through our visual storytelling. And um, so, yeah, it's a wonderful organization. Um, through the early years, we were doing a lot of things called raves, which were these rapid assessment visual expeditions. So people might have might have heard of bio blitzes, where you send biologists into an environment that might have some impending issue. Um, just, just you know, let's do a count, let's see what's here of birds and mammals and reptiles before the bulldozers come in. You know, 
uh, that's kind of the bio blitz uh, uh, idea with scientists. We were doing these raves with visual storytellers um, with the help of, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations like yourself that are working on conservation issues. Um, and like we worked on the border wall. So this whole wall starting here in San Diego, going all the way to Texas to separate um, Mexico and San Di and uh, United States from immigration issues. Well, there's a whole nother story that no one talks about. It's you're separating uh, habitats for wildlife and none of that wildlife can cross these impenetrable barriers. And when you make uh, kind of political decisions like that without talking to biologists and, and without talking to any of the scientists and you just put up a wall, you know, there's ways to, to kind of get both things taken care of. Um, you can make the wall a little differently so animals could get through, even smaller animals. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind the International League of Conservation Photographers. Yeah, I mean, that's incredibly noble. I agree. We often, you know, see animals through a lens and then forget that that's a real animal and there are real impacts on their lives and their habitats. And so this this league that you've created, which I love it because it sounds like superheroes, and I think it couldn't be more apt to what you all are doing, that you are your superheroes for the animals. And it sounds like it very much comes from a place of passion. With these you know, other photographers, do they have similar backgrounds to you where they started out loving the wildlife first and, and they have degrees in biology or, or similar experiences? You know, I think um, all of us come in to where we're at in, in different ways. Um, you know, my mentor was uh, Michael Nick Nichols. Uh, that's really, you know, that he was my mentor. I did a tiger project with him and a couple other projects for National Geographic. And, you know, he came into photography as a photographer. He really didn't know a lot about the animals, but he learned a ton. So, you know, and him coming into photography uh, totally different from me, where I was the biologist, you know, I came into photography thinking, you know, uh, a great picture was something that was tack sharp, you know, perfectly exposed, you know, a bird on a branch. Wow, that's that's a great picture to me. And to be able to be mentored by someone that thinks of, you know, 15th of a second with the 600 millimeter lens panning a gorilla going through Rwanda, you know, dark, moody movement, images that aren't technically perfect. Uh, I couldn't have picked a better teacher to, to you know, teach me. So we, we really all come in to this in a lot of different ways, some from the animal aspect, some photographers, and we all kind of meet in the middle. Um, and there's landscape photographers, there's macro photographers, there's, you know, bird photographers, there's more cultural photographers. So all those people kind of make up the league and they're all, you know, tops in their profession. But we all come in with a little different focus. And so on a rave, uh, which I was discussing a little bit about, you know, we get five or six of us go to a location. Um, I might be doing mammals sitting in a blind. Um, one of my other colleagues, you know, is doing the landscapes because that's what he's great at. Uh, another one, you know, she might be doing talking to the indigenous people there and photographing them in their village um, because that's what she's great at. So it, it's kind of that that common, um, you know, thread to, to help the issue get pushed along. Do you feel like there is a common bond between photographers that capture landscapes and photographers that capture wildlife because the two are so interconnected? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are different, you know, a little bit different tribes, you know. Um, I, I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine being a, a, a nat uh, kind of a landscape photographer. Um, you, you say I have patience and I do, I have patience for that harpy eagle coming into the nest. I have patience for, you know, the, the tiger coming back to the den. I certainly don't have patience to see the sun change on a mountain. I mean, it needs that there needs to be a heartbeat for me. Um, that's what drives me. And so, you know, landscape photographers have an amazing amount of uh, patience when it comes to conditions of light and just weather because you know they can go back to the same place and that mountain or that tree or that river changes all the time where i i need a little bit more as far as a living thing to get my heart pumping you know yeah no i i, I totally understand that 
Speaking of those moments that you capture, was there ever a moment when you felt you got a little too close to the action and you might have been a little fearful for the predicament you might end up in? Um, occasionally. That, that doesn't happen very often. Um, the one time that, pardon me, comes to mind is, once again, we, we mentioned uh, Nick Nichols from Nat Geo and the Tiger Project that I worked on with him in the mid-90s. Um, we had found a tiger den and we were, my, my job on the whole shoot, we did, it was a two year shoot, um, was kind of manning all of Nick's remote cameras. So we had seven remote cameras in the field. Um, that, that was my primary job was maintaining those as well as assisting Nick on a different elephant when we were shooting tigers in the morning, photographing tigers. Um, so uh, one time we found this tiger den and we were setting up a remote camera at the den. Um, it was a boulder situation where we had to jump down boulders to get where the opening was of the den. Uh, the young tigers were inside the den. Mom was on a adjacent hillside watching us and our guide and our mahouts, um, who didn't speak English very well, um, we're supposed to be monitoring her as Nick and I jumped in the boulder uh, den and started setting up flashes and cords and, and then trying to cover up stuff so she wouldn't notice. And, you know, that was a time where I felt maybe we, we, we've screwed up this, you know, we've all, we all know how protective uh, mothers are. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a mother duck or a mother, you know, goose or a mother, whatever. Uh, but a mother tiger is a whole nother animal. Yeah, that's that's life threatening. Uh, so, you know, our mahout would scream something out and we, we would scramble out of the boulder den. And of course, he wasn't saying she was coming, but we thought that's what he was saying. Yeah, I would say that would that was one of the most nerve wracking, you know, 20 minutes of putting up a, and the fastest we've ever put up a remote camera. You know, we whipped this thing out quick. So that, that was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, that sounds like it was. And it's, a, it's great that we just had a guest uh, ask a question about the rapport that you need to build with, you know, an animal to get close enough to them. And, and you and I have talked a little bit about, you know, the difference between the mountain lion in Chile and the difference between the mountain lion here in the States and the relationship that you're sort of able to have with those mountain lions in Chile, I thought that would be a great way to talk about this rapport, that the building of a relationship. Yeah, I mean, look at these images that you're, you know, you're seeing now. Th these can't be done with North American pumas, you know? I'd say 90% of our images, maybe, maybe even 95, 96% of all of our North American mountain lion, puma, pictures are camera traps. I mean, we're not even there. Um, and to be able to follow uh, Pumas, they know we're there. They see us. They allow us to follow them. Um, that is just amazing. It's something that before I started going to Chile, which was eight years ago, I would have never thought this was possible. Kind of like the same deal with Jaguars in the Brazil, you know, what I've ever thought photographing jaguars from a little boat in a river uh, was possible, I'd say, heck no, 15 years ago. And now I've been doing that trip for, you know, since 2009. So, yeah. Um, so there can be a rapport that comes around. If they're not getting harassed, if they slowly get used to a presence uh, that doesn't disturb them, they have no negative ramifications, cats become very relaxed. Um, um, well, look at our, you know, look at our wildlife in Africa. That's, that's habituation on an amazing scale. You know, those, those, that's generational habituation of these little land rovers following us around. They don't hurt us. We just do our business. So, you know, and that's kind of what we're seeing now in Chile. Um, not to that scale, but, you know, a little group of five or six people that are quiet, that walk in a small group, that don't approach too closely. There's, you know, now we have third, fourth generation of Pumas that have grown up, their moms relaxed with these group of people watching them. So they're relaxed. And 
there's nothing like it. It's it's really special. Um, in North America, it's good that our pumas are ghosts. You know, um, we'd have a lot fewer of them if they they showed themselves like like they do in near Torres de Paine National Park, which is a protected area. When I say we can do this with pumas in Chile, don't don't mistake me by saying you can go to Chile on some ranch and see a puma like this. No, they they kill pumas in Chile too, right? They're 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 ranchers. They have sheep. There's a lot of persecution of pumas in Chile, kind of like what we see here in North America. Um, but in protected areas, the pumas have become relaxed. Um, we don't have big enough areas that are protected enough um, that I can't see any pumas here in North America becoming this relaxed. And, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, if we had bigger areas that they had enough buffer around national parks, you know, the problem is if you have an habituated animal in a national park like Yellowstone, um, that animal leaves the park and he's subject to be killed. Think of our wolves in Yellowstone, you know, um, that happens with them. So, so yeah, we get to know the individual animals. They get to know individual groups of people aren't going to hurt them, you know, and so that, that builds trust. And, um, and it's just amazing to be able to do that, you know, go down there and watch that. When you talk about the difference between the cats in Chile and the, and the difference between the cats here, and we talk about the expanse of landscape, do you feel that one of the most detrimental factors to our mountain lions here is fragmented habitat? Definitely, especially in Southern California, um, but really throughout the United States, um, it's really a mosaic of habitat that these animals to, you know, to get that genetic material away from these little islands of habitat, they have to move. And, you know, males, especially males, tend to travel big distances looking for new females, trying to get that genetic material out to different populations. And uh, it's very difficult for, for pumas and mountain lions here in especially Southern California, you know. Um, I hear people, you know, a couple myths about mountain lions here in California. One, they're all over the place, you know. Uh, they're not all over the place. Uh, our mountain lions, every one of them is precious in California. It's estimated with the amount of habitat we have and the studies they do, they've done with, with uh, tracking pumas that we have maybe about 3,000 pumas in all of California. And California is a huge state and a state that most people would think, man, tons of habitat, should be plenty of room for pumas. Um, the problem is, you know, we're, we're dissected by a lot of freeways. Uh, we have marginal habitat next to good habitat, and it's in a lot of ranch land. Um, pumas aren't thought of very well um, by the ranching community. And so, um, and I think in general, um, we still need to improve their PR uh, stance. You know, uh, people still have a knee jerk reaction to, to someone seeing a puma in their neighborhood or, you know, and usually it's one of fear. And what are we going to do about it? We saw a puma. We're in danger. And that's just the wrong attitude. Um, I would be so, I, I've lived in this house in you know Southern California for 15 years and I've never seen a puma with my own eyes. I have tons of photos of pumas because I put remote cameras out, um, but I've never seen one with my own eyes. And boy, I'd love to see one. Um, so PR really has to get a lot better. Our, our acceptance of having a large predator and, you know, and being a little bit more forgiving if something happens with a large predator. You know, if we lose a pet, if we lose a goat, if we le le realize that we're here with them, you know, and maybe our husbandry of our animals has to be a little better instead of just knee jerking to go out and remove that, that wild animal that's been here and is surviving and doing his best. You know, he might've slipped and, you know, goats are, you know, or it's pretty easy prey, especially if you don't bring them in at night or you don't have, you know, we have a, a neighbor here where I live, I just heard of uh, a neighbor taking a shot at a mountain lion. Um, he had, you know, a goat taken, and but he had a fence that was six foot tall. I mean, that's not even going to keep a coyote, coyote out. Um, so, 
you know, if you if you love your animals, bring them in at night, um, put a tall fence because part of the beauty of living in California and other rural places is our wildlife. You know, that's why I'm here. You know, I, I couldn't stand living in a city. I love walking out my backyard and we saw a bobcat yesterday driving out and that's really rare. And once again, I get them all on my cameras all the time, but to see a bobcat in the daytime, um, these, these animals are living there and they're just under the radar. And that's the way it should be, really. Yeah, and I, I'd love to ask you, you know, you and I have talked about, especially here in, in North America, this shy, elusive ghost cat. Where, where do you think this ideal to make them into these scary monsters has come from? Is this something that has happened over history that we've built up in our minds as a society? Where did it come from that we turned them into the villains? Oh, that's what we're good at, right? We want to we want to make something scary, scarier than it is. We always, you know, we're so smart, but we feel so um, powerless when it comes to nature's predators. And so really every predator you can think of that has the possibility of of taking a human uh, is, you know, vilified. You know, think of our our wolves, our bears, you know, mountain lions, and you know, half the animals that can't do anything to us are still vilified. You know, I know half people think you know, bobcat's going to take them out on a trail. You know, and coyotes are a threat, which you know they're really not. You know, there might be some weird, you know, thing that might happen with a coyote, but ninety nine point nine nine coyotes are never going to mess with you. You know, they don't. They're just too smart for that. Um, if animals mess with people, they don't last. We take them out quickly. And so, um, yeah, it's just the way people are. We, we want to be afraid of something. And unfortunately for our wildlife, when you're afraid of something and you don't have the knowledge base about that animal, they become vilified. And then it's, you know, then it's, you know, we have to do something about you. You know, we all like the idea of, you know, a, a bear living here until you know it knocks over your garbage and now all of a sudden now it's a big thing now it's now it's we have to do something they're in our space doing something well how about we you know we just take a little good with the bad like yeah pick up the garbage and move on you know it's okay you know if if you lose you know something uh, realize you know we live in a beautiful place and a lot of it's because of our wildlife yeah, and I think that's really, you know, at the Mountain Lion Foundation, one thing that's very important to us is educating on coexistence. And that's the idea that we both have to be in this space. And, and if we do, like you say, if a bear comes and knocks over the trash can, then you get a bear proof trash can. And yeah. that's the theory behind coexistence. And I think that's really where we need to be headed with mountain lions. Um, and you've talked a lot about you know, the six foot fence that made it very easy for a mountain lion to scale that and grab a goat. And so one thing that we also work really hard towards is building pens with farmers that will prevent that kind of thing from happening. So again, it, I think it all really circles back to the idea of coexistence and taking responsibility for what our part is. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you, um, we, if we had a guest say to you, I, I love wildlife and I'd like to do what you do, two part question, what advice would you give them and, and how can we talk a little bit about camera traps and the benefit of people who are interested in photography and interested in wildlife, maybe starting out with camera traps? Yeah, um, first part of the question, doing what I do, um, it's a great hobby, uh, you know, being a photographer. I'd say in this, this landscape of, of where we're at, trying to pay bills and be a photographer, uh, good luck. You know, um, all of us that have been, been in the game a long time, um, most of us are running tours and workshops now um, because really imagery, there's just, there's no, no place for getting a paycheck from imagery anymore. So um, that's unfortunate to say, I mean, I, I mentor, a lot of young photographers and it's it's sad to kind of burst the bubble about you know becoming a wildlife photographer and you know making a living is is really the hard part um but it's a great hobby and um and so 
you know, and as far as trying to do some remote camera work, um, there's wonderful cameras on the market for, um, you know, monitoring wildlife. A lot of people start off with a little trail camera, you know, 100, 150 bucks. There's a ton of different companies. Um, a lot of hunters use them so they can see where the game goes, so they can set up their blinds or whatever. And I think that's really where it got it developed. Um, but they're great for wildlife lovers and just, you know, to put one in your backyard. If you have a little trail and any open space, you're going to have wildlife walking through there, you know, bunnies and maybe a fox or a bobcat. And it's fun just to see what comes through your yard when you're sleeping. And um, so those are great to put out. And I really find those are wonderful for putting on the video mode instead of the, the stills. Um, the stills, you know, the quality just isn't really there to kind of wow anybody. Um, and the video, the quality doesn't have to be great because you're seeing motion. And so it's, it's a little more compelling to see, you know, a mountain lion walking down a trail than to have a really crummy picture of a, you know, a blurry mountain lion uh, in the middle of the night. Um, the, the, the pictures that you see, I don't know if we've shown any camera trap pictures. These are all in Chile, so they're just photographing normally. Um, but the, the, my camera trap pictures and, you know, other people that, that do camera traps, um, to make nice imagery, you have to have a pretty complex little gear setup. Uh, it's a DSLR, so it's a high-end camera. You know, you have to protect that camera so it's in a waterproof housing. It needs to talk to multiple flashes, so there's wireless radios, uh, receivers and transmitters involved multiple flashes so you have that studio studio look so it looks really beautiful uh and then you know you kind of have to you have to have a, a, a device to get you know trigger the camera when it sees motion so those are a little bit more elaborate but they they're definitely out there you know uh there's companies like cam traptions is a great one uh, in the uk that uh produce all this stuff so if you want to spend a little bit more money uh actually a lot more money <laughs> To get nice pictures uh it's worth doing you know and uh it's so fun i mean there's nothing like going out to check your cameras it's can be it's like christmas you know you don't know what you're going to get um it's just a kind of a crap shoot you know it's all about where you put it and it's important you put it in a good spot and you know there's animal activity there and, and you light it well and you know there's a lot of details that you can screw up on um that you have a fail. We have a lot of failures with remote camera trigger, trigger work. Um, <clears throat> but when you get something nice, it's really special. Yeah, it is really special. You know, at, at the Mount Lion Foundation, we'll often have supporters share their camera trap captures with us. And it really is a thrill when you get to work in the morning and you see an email from a supporter and they say, look what I caught. And it is, it's Christmas morning. You're like, oh, that's so exciting. Look what you caught. Um, so I can't encourage people enough um, to get out there, get in nature, be part of nature, hike for a little bit, put up a camera trap. We love to see them. It's it's very exciting. And, and I do think it's a great way to, to have a hobby um, that's really um, impressive and, and exciting and, and benefits wildlife in a great way. So um, it's, it's really incredible. You've been photographing wildlife for a long time. What kind of drastic changes are you seeing in wildlife populations and in their habitats since you started? And, and how much of this do you feel is, is human driven? Yeah, I mean, it's um, there's no doubt. I mean, there's there's so much pressure on wildlife and wild places and, you know, never, never more than there is now. Uh, we have a, a growing population of people and there's it's really uh, the, the number one issue is we're just expanding our footprint everywhere. You know, look at look at where housing tracks are being built and it's always out in in rural areas and that impacts wildlife. Uh, there's just it's a space issue. Um, it's a tolerance issue, you know. Um, so. So I definitely see it, especially here in Southern California Boy, every 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 time I, I don't get out of the house much, I'm usually going just to the airport. And, and then I'm gone, but, you know, driving to the airport, wow, and another housing track, you know, that used to be where I used to look for snakes as a kid, you know, and ride my motorcycle around looking for snakes. It's, and now it's a thousand houses. So yeah, there's no doubt, you know, that there's that, those pressures there. Um, 
but you know in in in, in that same you know thought there are places that have gotten better you know in the last 20 years uh, tomorrow i leave for the osa peninsula which is uh, in costa rica and i've been going there since 1989 and i've seen a lot of changes and they're not all bad um, um it's you know it's a it's a smallish peninsula um on the southern part of costa rica uh, right across the gulf of dulce which is a kind of a gulf from panama so it's very south and there used to be a lot of cattle ranchers there and a lot of people that you know subsistence uh users of the environment uh, a lot of gold mining going on there and so it wasn't you know the tropical paradise that people might have thought oh wow if you went there 30 years ago it must have been amazing no it's actually more amazing now you know there's there's fewer of those subsistence people using the environment to survive they've left and you know other people have come in and bought up land replanted places that were deforested for beans and cattle before they put up eco lodges like my favorite lodge Bosque del Cabo where I'm going tomorrow um and now you know and bought up land next to them that used to have a rancher um those ranchers you know anything that moved it's a long way to get to town for meat so if you live out in the bush if something walks by that tastes good you're going to do what humans do you're going to you're going to take that animal to eat for dinner so uh, a lot less of that because the lodge I go to started off as a couple maybe 100 acres now they have over a thousand acres that they maintain and protect and so um yeah there's you know it's not all bad there's not there's good stories out there as well and I think all we can do is is continue if people get in wild places and love wild places they'll want to protect wild places you know if we're if we're never in wild places what's the use of protecting it you know um so that's that's part of you know what I've been doing for 30 years with the photography is is getting that imagery out there and now leading trips bringing people to wild places you know once you get them out there then they become advocates they they want to save where they've been and they realize it's precious you know yeah and i would imagine as a teacher as a leader of these expeditions um there must be some really proud moments for you when you see that someone not only understands your love of photography but now they also understand the value of the wildlife was there a moment as a as a leader that you had a particular proud papa moment with with one of your guests where they really got it all the all the time all the time and that's really one of the most rewarding parts of you know leading trips and and being with people um is is that you know those those moments uh i have a a couple that have been on many trips with me now, but their first trip was actually in the Osa Peninsula where I go, I'm going tomorrow. Um, elderly couple, he's, you know, the head of a oncology center, one of the big ones, you know, so his, his life revolves around um, going to meetings, flying to meetings, giving talks, giving lectures because he's world renowned in his industry. Um, but, you know his downtime was doing golf because he's at these resorts and he's speaking and you know and his his wife um was uh obviously along with him for all, a lot of these work vacations and you know going to nice hotels so they show up in costa rica at a wilderness lodge with me and i'm like oh boy are is this the right setting for these people that you know they they've their idea of travel and lodging is a lot different from where where i go um and i tell you it was it was an extremely rewarding uh moment uh one they loved it you know and and the first thing i heard when i when they got home back to boston um was that they both bought like high-end binoculars now for these golfers you know for them to uh buy binoculars that was that said it all like now they're watching birds now they're watching nature and it's exciting you know and they went on they went on many trips with me Botswana all these wild places and they loved it and so yeah that was that was that was perfect yeah yeah that's amazing and and I want to 
make sure that I, I say to the guests who are with, with us today, one, traveling is, is so important to broadening our culture, broadening our horizons. Um, and I wanna encourage people if they're thinking about, about going abroad, please consider a, a trip that is similar to what Roy does, or please go with Roy, because I think going with somebody who values the land and values wildlife changes the way that you experience it completely. And, and the footprint that you leave behind is not too deep of an impact. And that's really, really important. So if you're saying to yourself, oh, I'd love to go to Osa, please go to Osa with Roy. <laughs> so that you can value the wildlife and you can leave it. Because I lived in Costa Rica for many, many years. And one thing that was very important was to leave no trace and, and to respect the nature and respect the wildlife when you are there. Um, so if you're saying, oh, I, I'd love to get so-and-so a trip to Osa for Christmas, please make sure you pop over to Roy's page first and, and think about how much value there is in a trip like that. I think that's incredibly important that you go with someone who understands the nature, and understands the wildlife. Um, as someone who was a Costa Rica um, liver for a long time. So, <laughs> um, hey, I, saw, I saw a picture, Jessica. Can we talk about a picture? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Chelsea, could you back up to um, mountain lion under the Ceanothus or California lilac? So it's like two or three back. One more. <sighs> yeah. This is um, one of my favorite pictures of mountain lions. And, and I, you know, as a photographer, a lot of it is backstory why we love a photo, you know, how hard it was or whatever. We have history making a photo. So we're, we're emotionally tied to them where other people aren't. Um, but there's a little story about this. So for the last, this is my backyard. This is eh, 300 yards just behind me down the valley. Uh, I have a trail that I made in the valley, um, I guess about 12 years ago now. And, but for the longest time, I never had remote cameras on it. In fact, I never thought about doing much photography when I'm home. I mean, I was home so little that when I came home from a trip, my cameras went into the closet and I got to work around the house and trying to be a husband and trying to, you know, do what I needed to do. So I didn't do much photography when I was here. And so, um, you know, maybe five or six years ago, I started putting some trail cameras down there because that was manageable. You know, I didn't have to monitor them all the time. And I started seeing some mountain lion activity, which I had no idea that we had mountain lions walking through this valley. And it was super exciting. So in the last two years, really since COVID, because COVID really shut down my travel, shut down my work. So I was here. Um, so I'm like, okay, let me invest in some nice DSLR camera traps and make it a personal passion project to do my valley. Um, see what's, you know, I already, I know what's there now from the smaller trail cams, but I want to make nice imagery now. And that's, that's the next level. Um, so I started getting some pictures of mountain lions. This is, uh, this was, about five, six months ago, I remember, Ceanothus were blooming, so probably May or June. Um, they only bloom, this California lilac, they only bloom like two or three weeks out of the year. It's normally just a green bush, you know, in the valley. It's one of our kind of climax bushes in the chaparral. And I was checking my cameras, and if you can see this bow of this Ceanothus, the weight of the flowers brought the bough, the branch, all the way into the trail where I couldn't walk on the trail. And I was checking my cameras and I, you know, I've been gone somewhere. So I came home to this plethora of flowers. And the first thing I thought about was I need to cut this branch because this is my trail. This is where I walk. And luckily I got smart before I brought out the clippers. And I'm like, wow. Now, mountain lions in my area, since it's kind of a transitional, it's a thoroughfare. It's not a place they live. There's not enough habitat here, but it's a draw. It's a valley where they can move west to east and they can, they use that, my trail. It's a lot easier to use a trail than to walk through the chaparral. So they walk on my trail, but they only come by once a month. So I have, you know, I have one pass by and I might not get another puma for the next month. Um, so I thought it was a long shot, but let me, within that day, I put up a, a camera trap. 
Um, this picture was taken less than 12 hours. So the night that I put that camera out there, I just got the lottery. I won the lottery. This Puma, this male Puma, which I have have many pictures of him. Um, he walked under this bow and everything worked. You know, anybody that does camera trapping, there's always something going wrong. You know, flashes don't go off. Batteries, you know, there's just issues. Lots of technical issues. Um, but I, I, I almost cried when I saw this picture and to get it so quickly. I mean, normally I have cameras out there, I've been out there a year and none of them have put out a picture like this. So uh, this picture means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is stunning. And and to know that you almost didn't get it if you had just chopped that that limb, you would never have captured something um, really so incredible. So, yeah, I agree. This is a really, really special photo. Um, all right, I have to cherry pick my my questions because what happens is I get so excited to meet with someone like you, and then I have a million questions, and and then I have to cherry pick them at the end. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, tell us tell us about your current projects. What's next for you? You have traveled the world. You've taken some of the most beautiful photos. You have this incredible book celebrating one of the most biodiverse places, which is the OSA. Um, what's what's next for you? What's your next big thing? Um, this year is just a ton of travel. You know, we're coming off two years of postponed trips. So all of us that run tours and, and trips, we've just been postponing all of our trips and they're just all jammed together. So this is this year, you know, is is really all about kind of getting caught up with with travel and people that have been booked on trips to get them in the field and, you know, and be kind of done with trips that were booked two years ago. So a lot of travel this year. I'll continue to do the I mean, look at this picture, though, of like a pack of pumas. You know, when you see a mom, this is a mom with three older cubs that are the size of her. You know, in fact, her males will be bigger than her. So anyway, I, I'm sorry to digress, but I just that's a pack of pumas right there. Um, yeah, so a lot of travel this year, Jessica, uh, just kind of back to back to back to back. And after this year, um, you know, we'll see what what 2023 looks like. You know, at some point, I'll probably slow down some of the, the tour travel with guests and try to do a little bit more my own photography again, you know, as as a leader of a trip. You just you can't do your own work you know if you're going to be present for your participants you know you really can't do a lot of great in-depth work and so I, i'd love to get back in some projects where i get back in the field the harpy project is still something i'm pursuing um you know spend more time up in the trees of of tropical areas with harpy eagles and um yeah who knows who knows what's out there something new and exciting you know um, but anytime you're in nature, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a good time. No, I agree. It's a, it's a gift to be out there. And I can see why you get so jazzed about what you do. And, and so inspired by these images, when you get excited about them, I share that I can imagine that moment when you captured it. And, and I love being able to be this much closer, um, to, you know, a cat that I've loved most of my life. Um, so, and I appreciate you have really nonstop traveled. You just got home, you're leaving again tomorrow. Um, so we're really grateful that you carved some time for us today, because I know that it's been pretty hectic. Uh, what I am going to do is we've had so much great interaction from our guests. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a step back and I'm going to let our guests have some time with you and, and ask you some of the questions I know that they're really excited for. Um, so you stay where you are. I'm going to go ahead and take a step back and We'll, we'll let the Q&A begin. Okay. Looks like Derek has a question. So Derek, if you'd like to ask your question now. Um... Uh, actually, uh, my question was answered. My question was about building the rapport with the animals. Uh, getting the trust. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you all. You've come on an, an amazing event. Great. Thanks for attending. Okay. Um, we have one, a bunch of questions in the popped into the chat. Uh, this one says the mountain lions in Chile appear longer and more muscular than those in Colorado. Are they 
a different variety? Um, no, they're not a different variety. Um, just some local local variation. Their color seems to be different, um, a little bit lighter. Um, but you know, I'm not sure about really sure about the genetics. Uh, you know, they're the most wide ranging cat we have in North America. You know, going from the top of British Columbia all over the tip of Chile. So they uh, they're super adaptive, um, but. I'm pretty sure they're pretty much the same same animal, you know, with slight variations. You know, we have a definitely a different subspecies in the pumas in Florida. Really, a, a disjunct genetics there with that population. Um, but, but people that are scientists when it comes to pumas would might want to chime in and correct me. Pumas also they look a lot different depending on where they live. So where I'm going tomorrow, Costa Rica, boy, the pumas are small and scrawny in most tropical rainforests. Um, one, they're not top dog. Uh, jaguars are above them in those locations, but uh, those habitats just suit a smaller, smaller animal. Uh, colder areas, you know, you have larger animals. So um, you saw one picture of a the largest cat I've ever seen. It's uh, it's it's got snow behind it and it was actually a winter trip i did down in patagonia and it had to be a 200 plus pound male puma and it was just gargantuan you know just a huge animal looks so different than any of the mountain lions you'll find in any tropical area okay well we had a lot of questions come into the chat so if anyone wants to ask their question please raise your hand Come on, people, you got some questions, I know. All right, well, then I'm going to go ahead and ask more of my questions because I had a lot. <laughs> we're waiting for some people. Maybe we were just, we were so good, Jessica, we answered <laughs> all the questions. We hit all the points. We hit all the points. So I had a great question I, at, when, when I was announcing that I was doing this interview with you, of course, all my friends come out of the woodwork and they're all like, well, can you ask this question for us? Can you ask this question for us? And I had a friend ask a really cute question that I thought would be fun if I got the opportunity in the Q&A. And she is a big cat lover. She's got several cats of her own. And she said, would you please ask him when he's out in nature, has he ever, what's the most house cat thing you've ever seen a big cat do? Any big cat at all? You know, that's the thing about cats. They're, they're not that different. I mean, domestic cats have all the same behaviors as wild cats. I mean, and they're still, you know, we all know how capable, unfortunately, how capable of hunters they are. They are unlike dogs or, you know, you see that domestication and you're like, man, my basset hound could never survive in the wild, you know, just about every domestic cat, you know, even the fat ones, once they've you stop feeding them, they're going to lean up and they're going to be able to survive. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So, I mean, all the, you know, the, the, the bathing, the rolling on their back, the sleeping 20 hours a day, you know, all those things wild cats do just like your house cat. It's not that different. The males, you know, your male house cat, if he isn't neutered, you know what he's doing. He's covering the whole neighborhood looking for girlfriends. That's what they do in nature, you know. So there's, there's such a parallel. I mean, you're, you're anybody that loves, you know, wild cats, you're going to love domesticated cats too. They're just all the same. You know, they really act very similar. And um, I, I do see a question that just popped up and then um, I'll, I'll ask this for this individual. It's from Audrey. And she said, do you worry that gaining trust from mountain lions habituates them to hunters? Is that a worry for you? Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, where we work with mountain lions, and it's protected. It's a protected area, um, and it's big enough protected area where they're not leaving that protected area and being like, "Oh, it's just a person, no big deal." Um, so that's the key. You, you have to be in huge areas where you know there's buffer. You know that animal's not moving outside of those areas. 
uh, animals in in our where we work with uh, with mountain lions, um, they have all of Taurus that Pioneer National Park as a border. And then we work on some large uh, ranch territory that the rancher has switched from doing, you know, sheep and other you know, things that he used to do and is doing, you know, tourism now. So it's he's saving his his land for pumas. Um, um, so I really don't worry about it where we're working with pumas. If any of those cats, especially males, if they move in huge areas and leave the ranch or don't go back into Torres de Paine, <clears throat> those males tend to be shyer. Right? They they know when they go in ranch land, open territory, that they're at risk. They're they're not they're not you know and they know what's going on. So we see cats that are nervous. They tend to be males uh, for the most part, because males territories are much larger and likely that they move out of these protected areas. And, you know, they have bad, bad interactions with people. So, so it's, it's not something I personally worry about. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, ranchers that are, are sort of um, enveloping this idea that ecotourism is a positive thing. Um, and we at the Mountain Lion Foundation uh, really believe in building a positive relationship with these individuals. Do you see a trend for that? Do you see more ranchers and farmers adopting a better a better relationship with the wildlife? Certainly, certainly. It's, you know, for, for most uh, people, it really needs to come down to, uh, you know, is this gonna help me feed my family? You know, that people aren't ranchers because they just love ranching. They're ranching because that's what their father did. And that's, that's how they feed their family. You know, it's, it's so if you give them an alternative um, that's brings in and brings in the money and feeds their family, then, you know, people start adopting that. So definitely people are looking at, uh, you know, other ranchers in the area that are, you know, have hot, it's very tough business being a rancher, you know, the, the bad weather comes in, Half your flock is lost, um, and uh, you know it's been a little tough being in the tourist industry the last two years because of COVID, um, and so that's that's been scary to think about what's happening with my ranch. You know he doesn't he's not making money off sheep, so he hasn't had tourists for two years. You know it it scares me. You know our you know, we need to get back because tourism protects places. You know, I think of my places I go in Africa. You know, these these safe areas for animals in Africa, they're safe because of tourism dollars. You know, without tourism dollars, it's easy for the poachers to come in. It's easy for there's no one there. You know, there's no one's watching the hen house because, you know, they're so. You know, people that are still on the fence about traveling, I understand that aspect. But I tell you, the last three places I've been, so I just got back from Peru. Uh, uh, I was in Brazil in August doing my Jaguar trip. And I was in Kenya on my honeymoon uh, in May. And all of those places, um, although there was some hoops to jump through, you know, taking a COVID test before you fly, wearing a mask blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's, it's, it's a little more complicated filling out something online before you fly. Um, but all of those places were amazing to travel right now because there's no people. We were the only ones in the Mara, Masai Mara in May, which that, that's, that never happens. We were one of, you know, we are a group, small group in uh, Machu Picchu uh, last month in Peru with 200 people all day at Machu Picchu. Before COVID, seven or 8,000 people a day at Machu Picchu. Um, Brazil, to be one of the few people on the river watching a mother jaguar feeding her two babies on the beach. That would, that probably would not happen without, you know, this lower traveling rate because she'd be a little bit nervous. You know, if there was five or six boats on the river watching her, would she really bring her cubs out on the beach and feed them in front of us? But it was just us. So if you're on the fence about traveling, you know, it's, it's, I, I felt as safe in all these places than I, I'm, than I feel going to, to Costco. You know what I mean? It's like, 
the, the mass, the protection. You go into a wilderness place. There's no other people there. In Brazil, we're on a boat. There's no one there. We're in, so it's it's pretty safe. So I know we've jumped off the topic here, Jessica, and I do that sometimes. Uh, but you know, get out and travel more because it it really helps protect our wildlife. It's just not great for you. Think of all these guides, all these lodges, all these guards, all these people that protect our wildlife. They need that tourism dollar. You know, that's what keeps them going. And so it kind of scares me when everybody just decides, you know, let's not travel forever. And it scares me when the U.S. government just puts a, you know, don't travel there, don't travel there. Oh, something happened, don't travel there. That scares me because those there's huge ramifications when you stick a country on a no-fly list. And you're like, don't go there. It's unsafe. You know, come on. It's, you know, it's, you can be safe, right? But just don't, you know, block a whole country because of something. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I understand that completely. And um, Chelsea is telling me that people got braver and we have some hands raised for some <laughs> questions. Um, so though I could go on forever with you, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so they can ask their question. Yeah. Derek, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've seen some stories of lions and tigers contracting COVID, like in the zoo. Um, uh, I, I just did a Google search and haven't seen any, but you all might be more tapped into, you know, what's happening in the, the puma world. Have there been any stories of pumas uh, contracting COVID yet? And how, how do it, because when you, when you all are out there, um, maybe not necessarily, uh, the photographers, but when mountain lions get like tranquilized and then they check them for, you know, diseases and take some blood work and stuff, um, just like regular humans, we can be vaccinated and still pass on this, this virus. So there's a possibility that even though a whole team of vaccinated um, biologists are out there dealing with this animal, they could still pass COVID on to it. And it's something I hadn't considered until, you know, until this talk. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably let Jessica, maybe take that more. I, I've never been involved in a, you know, kind of the, the biology of, you know, kind of putting a, you know, collar on a, on a mountain lion or something. Uh, you you got to know those, those things happen so rarely, you know, how many mountain lions do we have getting collared? You know, very few mountain lions are getting collared. Very few people are interacting with wild mountain lions, you know, certainly not photographers. We never get that close to mountain lions. You know, we got our remote cameras. Um, in, in Chile, we're, you know, 30 feet away. So yeah, there's, there's no, really no chance for photographers, but I, I get your point. I understand how, you know, biologists working, but it's, think about it, it's, they might capture two, three mountain lions a year, I'm guessing, and put collars on. I don't know, Jessica, do you have more info on that? Yeah, I, I think really just from like a broad science perspective, when you look at animals in captivity, uh, it's sort of like saying, I'm going to go to a Denny's and be around a lot of people versus being out in nature. Um, the cats in nature are going to have much, much lower to almost no chance of catching something. And, and I won't say hundred percent no, because of course I can never say that I'm not a scientist. Um, but in a captive situation where people are coming to a zoo and, and, and larger populations, I think that's really where it comes from with, with wildlife catching, catching COVID. And I think very much Roy is correct in that when you're out in nature, getting these photos, you're, or, you know, the moments that you are collaring, um, the, the interaction is, is very small and, and the chance of it very low, I would think. Okay, we have some questions that came in through the chat. Um, Linda would like to know, have you photographed all of the big cats? And are you planning a book that highlights the cats, especially mountain lions? All right, good question. Have I photographed all the big cats? No. Uh, clouded leopard? Never photographed clouded leopard. Um, as far as big cats go, yeah, probably most of the other big cats for sure. Um, you know, it'd be fun to be, it's, I shouldn't say fun. It would be fun to do a book, but books are hard, you know, and um, there's really low chance of ever making your money back on doing a book. I mean, it's people, we like books, but how many people are really buying books nowadays? I mean, it's like everything's on the internet. So 
to get someone to publish a book is one thing. People just don't want to spend money, you know, and books take time. The Osa book took me six years to photograph. I was going down three, four times a year for a month at a time. Um, and none of that's cheap. You know, that's a lot of, it's a lot of work. So although we like books and they're fun to have on the coffee table, trying to produce one is daunting. And if you self-publish, big money, you know, trying to have a, a reasonable amount of print run done. So, but maybe through Mountain Lion Foundation, you know, we can raise some money and, and I can do a Mountain Lion book. Let's do that. Jessica, what do you think? <laughs> All right, we have some more questions. Uh, Gretchen asks if you use Photoshop to improve your any of your shots. Good question. Um, I'm a pretty much the way you see it is the way it was shot kind of guy. Um, and so you're really not going to see much difference from um, from anything you see from the way it came out of the camera. Uh, obviously, when you shoot a format like I do, which is raw, um, everything, something has to be done to the image just to make it look like film. You know, the blacks aren't black, so they're very flat images. So we all have to make a raw into a JPEG or a different form. And of course, we just have to make it look like it would again if it was film. So, but yeah, the answer is, I. luckily I'm just don't have the skill set to do a lot of post-processing, which is, I think, a very good thing. Because if I had that skill, I'd be like, I want every branch to be perfect. And so I'm, I'm lucky in that regard that I, I just don't have the skills to go crazy. So yeah, I like, I like a little bit more of a raw picture. So uh, my pictures won't look perfect, you know, and nature is rarely perfect. We have two more questions right now. Uh, when you're in the blind, are you masking your scent somehow as well? Um, it depends on what you're photographing. Um, harpy eagles and most birds don't have a sense of smell, so it doesn't really matter. You know, I can smell as bad as ever, and believe me, I did. Um, so it's more about visual, you know. Um, I'm trying to think, I was sat in blinds for tigers, um, but didn't mask our scent. You know, the idea most predators they're going to know you're there, even though you're in a blind. That's, they're just smart enough. They're gonna know something's there, but they're not quite sure. Um, and as long as you keep your movements to a minimum, um, they don't get that nervous. So, so I don't really have to mask my scent, no. All right, one more for now, or two more questions. Uh, one from Sean Hoover says in the opening video what made you choose that particular water puddle to set up your camera good question so uh i'm in southern california water is a magnet it's a premium um we we're looking at another dry you know drought year uh where i live in san diego we average 10 inches of rain a year so you always know wildlife needs to go to wild uh, water so i've actually built some water um around my property, you know, built some little ponds so the wildlife can get some water in the dry periods. Um, where that uh, video was taking is a little depression in the granite that naturally collects rainwater, but we just don't rain very much. So it's dry most of the time. So, um, so I actually add water to that um, just to keep some water in there for the wildlife. And, uh, you know, I was super lucky when that mom Puma came by. That's the only time I've had Puma there was that mom. And she actually had three cubs. Um, the video just showed one. Um, but the next day on another trail camera, I got pictures of her and her cubs, three of them. Um, that was August 18th. And she has been back. So I was hoping I'd get to see the cubs a little older. And maybe I still will. But now we're, what, four months ago or three months ago. So um but yeah so i just knew that's a good spot so i i've had my camera there for probably about seven months now okay and then i got one more question uh hans would like to know about how much would a medium grade dslr camera trap cost good question 
Um, I'd say if you buy, like I buy stuff on eBay, like you know, buy my flashes used, buy a used entry level DSLR, you could probably get in for under a thousand dollars. You know, an entry level DSLR, you can get three or four hundred dollars. A flat flashes you can get for fifty to seventy five dollars each. Then you got to buy, you know, some some transmitters and receivers. So yeah, probably within a thousand dollars you could have a really nice setup. I think that might have been our questions. Um, if there's anybody else who has any questions, um, go ahead and raise your hand now and Chelsea can let me know that you've got something to ask. Otherwise, um, Roy, I think that we're just in general, just in awe of the work that you do and really, really grateful for the time that you gave us today. That was great. Thanks for reaching out and asking me to do this. This was, this was wonderful. Yeah, this is the best part of my job is spending time with with people like you. So I'm super grateful that you were here today. Um, I think that we're done with our Q&A. And so I want to thank all of our, our guests. Thank you for joining us for our Living with Lions webinar series. We really look forward to having people like Roy join us and share their experiences and their love for the mountain lion uh, with us. So thank you for being here today. And we wish you all um, a really happy weekend. Thanks, Roy. Thanks so much. Cheers.